After releasing a streamline of banger Mario Kart titles, with the most recent one being a large success in turning Mario Kart into a household name internationally, Nintendo was willing to try and make a Mario Kart game for the Wii. I mean, they really had to, there was no way around it. And with the success of the Wii, putting Mario Kart on there was a no-brainer. They were ready to cash in their checks for the year, this time starting early. Despite having a close launch date with Super Smash Bros. Brawl, Mario Kart Wii outperformed in the weekly sales and managed to pass not only Brawl in terms of sales numbers, but essentially every Mario Kart number up to that point, now being the second best-selling Wii game of all time. Hell, there are even reports of people still buying copies of Mario Kart Wii to this very day. Why so? I don't know. Maybe it has to do with the gameplay, or expansive roster, or the overall content and effort put into this game. Well, why don't we check some of the reviews on this game? Maybe they have some great things to tell us about. Ah, uh... uh... Hmm. Well, they aren't bad, per se, or even mediocre, but this is levels below in comparison to the other Mario Kart games, especially with the trifecta of claimers of the past three games? Something's gotta be up. Well, luckily for me, video game journalist reviews hold as much value to me as a copy of 1-2-Switch. We'll be looking at it for ourselves, and determining whether it is a masterpiece like the earlier games were, or whether it's only popular just because of a small sub-community that plays it for task, competition, or content purposes. I don't know what I'm saying, let's just get into it. Alright, we're already starting off strong with the fact that the game allows us to create up to four files. So, uh, when we get in this back in the If you actually look closely, they reuse the images of the Mushroom, Star, and Shell from Mario Kart Double Dash. That's just how much their models stand out in comparison to the newer images. One thing to note immediately upon entering your files, all the little modes here. Not only do we have a single player and multiplayer option, but we now have Wi-Fi connectivity returning from Mario Kart DS, this time a lot less restrictive in comparison to how Mario Kart DS was. The trade-off is that you'd likely encounter hackers in the matches you race in. There also exists multiplayer Wi-Fi connection mode, which allows you to play with two players locally connected to the internet. Finally, the Mario Kart channel makes its debut, showcasing time trial records records, ghost staffs, and tournaments. Though you can no longer officially access these modes, the mass amount of online gameplay uploaded on stream sites along with the capabilities of Weemfy allow you to soar back into getting these documented cases as proof of just how much fun yet broken the Wii Online was. Nonetheless, it still seems to have a performance 10 times better than that of Brawl's. The main sauce of the game is the single player and multiplayer choices. For multiplayer, the game reverts back to 4 player split screen, though online could take up to 12 players. When playing with more than 2 players, the game starts dropping in frame rates, which is a bit of a bummer considering that almost every other Mario Kart was optimized to play at their native resolution. I guess it was supposed to be a trade off for keeping all of the courses assets, as earlier Mario Kart games tend to have gotten rid parts of them. But even then, this isn't particularly true. It's not a whole lot, but it's still removed nonetheless. Various modes return from earlier Mario Kart games, including Grand Prix, the single player exclusive time trials, versus mode, and battle mode. For some reason, although you can configure solo team races in versus mode, you can't do so for battle mode. You're always stuck in team battles, which I think is kind of dumb, because now every game follows a point system timed elimination format rather than a last man standing format. So if you try to eliminate someone in balloon battle, it'll only take them out of the game for a few seconds before respawning them with a whole stack. Furthermore, battle modes cannot be configured or are designed to be infinite. They are always timed to 3 minutes and 3 minutes only. There's no way to configure this in the rules or anything, and it plays in both Balloon Battle and Coin Runners. Oh yeah, Coin Runners. Just think of it like Shine Runner, but it's a one match elimination format, rather than eliminating the players with the least amount and going from there, and also not having shines on the course. The selection here is pretty low, and for that, it's probably one of the battle modes I go back to the least. On the plus side, however, battle mode has the most amount of battle stages in the series thus far, five completely new arenas and five from past games. Some of the new ones are nothing to write home about, Block City and Chain Chomp will come to mind, but the rest are good, fun battle stages with various obstacles and gimmicks to them. And of course, they all still work as one thing, an arena to fight in. Of course, they had to ruin this lineup by bringing back the worst battle arena in Mario Kart. One of the options you'll always have to make in every mode besides your controller configuration for multiplayer is the type of drift you want, automatic or manual. Automatic allows you to drift corners without pressing buttons, but does not grant you a drift boost, while manual requires you to input to drift, but gives you drift boosts in return. Now, unless you're new to the series, manual is the best form of option. 
However, don't let it trick you into thinking it's the same form of manual as Mario Kart Double Dash and DS, because what they mean by manual is simply manually pressing the buttons yourself, not manually inputting movements to get drifts. I mean, you can kind of do it in a way, but it's not literal manual inputting like how the earlier games did it. Rather, the new drift system is based on how long you stay in the drift and how hard you're leaning one way. This makes any chance of snaking essentially impossible to pull off even if you try to do the actions in a similar manner. I suppose the trade-off is that now you can get a smaller boost off of a blue spark rather than having to wait to get any sort of boost by reaching the orange spark. I'll dive more into this later when it matters, but for now we're going to move on to the characters. This time being double that of Mario Kart Double Dash. <laughs> you see what I did? Although you start off with the same amount, you grow your numbers more when unlocking characters, which can either be done by racing through the Grand Prix or doing solo races on time trials, which besides doing staff ghost races for a few characters is probably the worst option, since some of the race requirements are in the thousands to get them. So it's probably best in your favor to just play through the Grand Prix even if it does get tedious later on. For the most part, each two rows are divided by weight classes. A lightweight spot reserved of small and baby characters, a middleweight spot reserved for some of the more human-like or looks kind of medium-sized characters, and a heavyweight spot reserved for the big boy characters. Oh, and also a light-ass girly girl. But that black hole under her dress probably has some bullshit weight density to it. I don't know, I'm not fucking Einstein. And as per usual, for a AAA Wii title, you can use your Mii as a playable character. Well, two versions. One sporting a normal racing suit, and one with overalls. Remember the supposed outfit C that was rumored across the entire game's lifespan? How there was a third outfit for the Mii which many speculated to be either a mix of the overall racing outfit, or a new outfit or costume completely? Crazy. And there was actually outfit C option found in the data of this game, though it does nothing, which is to be expected. Some cut data also shows that PD Piranha, Paratrooper, and Hammer Bro were likely to be playable in this game. You can find more of this kind of stuff on the cutting room floor. It's a neat website that covers a bunch of changes, cut content, and beta stuff from different games. I generally don't like covering cut content unless it pertains to the development of the game or to make a point because they aren't often part of the final game, but Mario Kart Wii was the odd one out simply because of the rumors surrounding it during its release that often coincided with the unused data left behind it. Anyways, the cart selection. Now there's bikes involved in the mix. That's cool, you know, even with the variety of different car options, they all controlled about the same. Really, only their speed and drifting showed the difference between the carts. Now with bikes, you got an alternative choice compared to carts, this time allowing a motor vehicle that can take sharper turns much more easily, but also being a sort of glass cannon since most bikes often weigh less than carts do overall. Of course, it doesn't play out as well in the long run, but we'll talk about that when we have to. Unfortunately, this select option brings about one of my biggest issues with Mario Kart Double Dash, and yep, as you can guess, it's the weight division between the carts. I don't like it in Mario Kart Double Dash and I don't like it here too. Sure there is more stat variety between the carts and bikes, but I'd still rather have an abundance of carts and bikes allowed for all characters rather than a select sum even if there is more variety added. It's not that controversial of an opinion, and in fact it's kind of shared opinion around the Mario Kart community. After picking our drifting options, we then go into the cup selection screen. Just like in Mario Kart DS, there exists a Nitro Cup selection and a Retro Cup selection, and both work exactly how it did in Mario Kart DS, having to play the first two cups and then continuing from there. So I already mentioned how great the Mario Kart Wii lineup is for the Retro Cups. There's no bad choices here besides my subjective taste, but I was also kind of taken aback over how good most of the Nitro Cup tracks are. I remember at a younger age, only like 5 courses standing out to me, but many of these tracks genuinely stand out to me as a really fucking fun or just plain good design for a track. Really, if I had to point out any of the new tracks I'm not a fan of, it'll probably be Mario Circuit and Dry Dry Ruins, and that's only because I think they're a bit boring to go through. Nothing wrong with their layout, they're just a bit boring compared to everything else there is. I think what makes many of the new courses so fun and unique is because of the tricking mechanic implemented. Every course with the exception of DK's Jungle Parkway and Mario Circuit 3 all have some sort of area or single spot that you can do tricks on, and doing tricks can be done on any cart or bike by either simply shaking the Wiimote and or nunchuck, or pressing on the D-pad if using a GameCube or Pro Controller. Apparently, each D-pad input makes the character do a unique animation assigned to it, but it always seemed kind of random for the most part, so take that with a grain of salt. But yeah, tricking is what changes this game up and is probably the biggest gameplay change to this game. Especially since Mario Kart DS had a lot of ramp-like structures that you simply couldn't do anything with, and was also kind of a negative since the air physics in that game were absolutely horrendous. In this game, flying in the air gives you much stronger control over your character and also gives you a hell of a lot more air time. And although it may seem unrealistic for a cart to do 
that. It's also unrealistic to drop into lava and not die immediately upon entering it. I do wish the trick's lengths were somewhat universal, however, since smaller ramps often lead to characters immediately touching the ground, which is good for getting an immediate boost, but on stages like GBA Bowser Castle 3, you're essentially held back from this because almost all of the time you just end up biting the curb and falling straight into lava. Like you might as well just put up a sign that says you're blue balling me because how are you going to have all of these trick ramps and not allow me to trick because the physics don't want me to make it above the platform. The trick physics overall can be a bit wacky sometimes, especially if you only have upward momentum or go beyond a point where the ramp wall isn't a trick boost. But overall, I've had really rare moments where a trick had actually screwed me up, not counting any sort of external hazards involved. Mario Kart Wii actually introduces a few new gameplay features for the game. Some that would become mainstays while others... and eh, not so much. Not really a first, but technically a first for the series is the ability to look behind you. This option did exist before in Super Mario Kart, but was triggered on its own whenever a CPU was about to give you its daily fuck up. In this game, you can simply get a behind view by pressing Y on the GameCube controller. Another new thing added is when performing a spin turn, which can either be with A plus B, L or R, you can obtain a drift boost in order to help you catch up from any undesired spots or scenarios, like rolling far off road or into a bad corner. It can also be helpful as an acceleration boost if you manage to get knocked to zero speed. I actually like this change a lot, though still not a fan of the whole camera moving along with your turn. But it's a little bit easier on the eyes compared to Double Dash and DS. Probably because of the game's widescreen support. Honestly, that shit goes a long way and it's good to see it in a series like this. A new addition to the game is the ability to perform a wheelie. This can be done by performing essentially a trick input whenever you're racing on the road and can only be done by bike users. It gives you a temporary slight speed boost that can be repeated immediately after dropping the first one at the cost of having very slight direction and movement. You can only really go straight forward and slightly influence a left or right lean, which is what also can be done at the start of the race to put you in the direction you want. You have to be close to or around top speed to activate it, simply trying to do it when you have low or no speed will leave your character in discontent over trying to see you activate something that you know you couldn't do in real life anyways. Like why are you bothering with this? Just wait 3 seconds dude, it's not fucking Formula 1. Wheelies are overall just a positive for bikes, and shows the clear advantage they hold over carts. The only negative there is to wheelies is that if you get bumped while in a wheelie, you get sent a lot farther and lose all of your speed from it, but even then this shouldn't happen a lot if you know how to hop, because hopping simply cancels the wheelie out. So even if you get bumped while hopping out of a wheelie animation, then you simply get the normal pushback you, you would usually have. This mechanic was supposed to be the replacement for the orange drift turbo boost you'd get with a cart, as you can only achieve a mini turbo with the bike, but the compensation was just too strong for the bike. Since carts often need some sort of angle to achieve the drift boost, wheelies only need to happen straightaways. And not just that, but since they can be cancelled at any time, they can work wonders on even the smallest length of straightaways. And since there are a lot more options to obtain a wheelie than there is to obtain a full drift boost, wheelies in turn have a lot more power to them. Not only that, but some bikes have different forms of drifting altogether. Some bikes are internally classified as sports bikes. These specific bikes, such as the Mach bike and Flame Runner, drift differently compared to the rest of the other bikes in all the carts, in that they commit to the turn rather than turning by the rear. These bikes do take a bit harder to get used to, but once you know how it works, you can go around even the tightest of corners in this game with no repercussions whatsoever. Because of these attributes, sports bikes are commonly called the best vehicles in Mario Kart Wii, and they certainly aren't wrong. They're helpful in dealing with the higher engine classes, are very smooth, and control very well when you get used to them. And they are just overall fun to use, there's no denying it. But because of these special characteristics, they essentially make carts completely unneeded. There really isn't a reason to ever use carts with the exception of the required 50cc starting option. I always like to categorize Mario Kart Wii's Grand Prix into two difficulties, cart only and bike only. For bike only, 50cc and 100cc is essentially baby mode with 150cc being the real challenge. It doesn't matter how good you are with even the best vehicles, 150cc will kick you down whenever it feels so. For carts only, it's like 50cc is the easy mode, and then all of a sudden it's a huge difficulty jump when entering 100cc, and then frankly, it's borderline infuriating to use carts in 150cc. Gotta be honest, I'm glad that the cart only requirement is locked to 50cc only, because trying to win cups using a cart in anything higher than that feels nigh on impossible sometimes. I seriously wonder if people genuinely use the carts in the higher CC because of just how much of a disadvantaged state you're already put in just by starting the race. Besides the CPU and item system simply being unforgiving, they just don't match the capabilities 
that bikes have in those engine classes, which is why almost every CPU seems to use a bike in 150cc and mirror. Now you might be thinking, the other bikes that aren't classified as sports bikes use the same drifting technique that carts use and they can't get an extra turbo boost off of it. Wouldn't that make them worse than the bikes? Well, not really, simply because of the wheelie ability these bikes still have. They don't hold the tight drifting corner values that the sport bikes have, but they still are a superior alternative to carts simply because of the wheelie option. And regarding wheelies, they are definitely a fun addition to the game that just makes the bikes all the more better. But that same sentimental value I have for wheelies is also shared with snaking in the earlier Mario Kart games. And at least in those games, every single vehicle could perform snaking. Some just had better and faster payoffs from doing it. But at least the option was there for every single cart, even the weakest of ones. Now that snaking is essentially gone, carts don't have any form of fast speed ability like bikes do with wheelies, and that simply segregates the options you can choose from. How I think they should have handled this is in two ways. Either allow carts to have some form of unique characteristic that can equate it to bikes, like allowing them and only them to have manual input for drifting to allow for snaking like in the two earlier games while still retaining the boost added in the game, or simply ridding of wheelies and making the timing on sport bike drifts a bit longer to achieve a boost off of. I get that they didn't want to alienate their audiences with snaking, and apparently there is evidence of this simply by looking at old forums and complaint posts about snaking online, but all they did was reintroduce the concept in a much more divided manner so now instead of letting every vehicle be able to perform it with varying success, they instead locked it to a specific subset of bikes on an already separate vehicle option that in and of itself is superior to carts in every way possible. Carts are essentially useless in this game because even if you don't like the sports bikes, you always have the option to choose the other bikes since they function exactly the same but with overall better stats and characteristics that carts just don't have. Don't take this as me shaming bikes or anything because trust me, that feeling you get when you drift around a huge curve is such a satisfying feeling and I won't deny that the wheelie was a fun addition that helps not only in speed, but dealing with the rubber banding of the AI in the higher engine classes. But having them removed in favor of balancing the game's vehicles would not be a problem to me. And judging by the later games and the receptions, it seems as if most would likely agree to. Anyways, I'm done ranting on and on about bikes. They're not even my favorite vehicles in real life, so let's talk about something else about this game. Hmm. Oh, I know! Let's talk about another thing I hate about this game, and that is how awful the knockback animation is when coming into contact with hazards. In every game besides Super Mario Kart, small forms of hazards and items will often send you spinning or flailing forwards with decent momentum. This allowed you to easily pick back up in the race against the rest of the AI in order to bring about a more fast paced design to an otherwise sluggish racing formula. Only a few items like the blue shells and fake item box in select games force you into a complete stop when colliding, but even then can still send you into a bit of momentum saving any close finish line wins. This all changed around Mario Kart DS when most items made you lose most form of momentum and could even straight up launch you completely vertically in the air, with the exception of the banana and road slicks which you would still have a bit of momentum afterwards, but not as immediate as something like 64 or Double Dash. This was to promote a more offensive item system in comparison to the earlier games, where you could often hold the lead by simply keeping 5 bananas behind your cart. It also forces destruction of items behind you or in your inventory when hit by more explosive items to guarantee that you don't hold a strong defensive lead throughout. The trade-off was the introduction of invincibility, which wasn't a huge window, but often saved you from immediate right on the nose chain attacks, and a slightly faster recovery time when hit by more powerful items, especially compared to Double Dash, where not only were you sent vertically upwards upon contact, but also had to slowly regain speed due to your partner dragging down the cart. The hit stun animations take so goddamn long to recover from, and what makes it worse is that you have so little invincibility, it may as well be non-existent, which means if another item falls up on you, you're gonna take the hit whether you want to or not. What doesn't help is if you get hit by anything else, even a passerby during your hit stun animation, you get sent much farther since you're treated as a featherweight object. These knockback moments can result in a full drop from your earlier position, since the knockback often resets your speed too, and not only that, but it can also knock you far into an off-road area or completely off stage if there isn't any form of connected land below. Honestly, I think it wouldn't be as notable if it weren't for the item bounce being so fucked in this game. Okay, well there's more to it than just the item system. There are other factors like the earlier mentioned invincibility, the rubber banding system, the AI characters, and the extra positions, so we'll go one by one on this. 
The item balance has two systems in this game, one for player controlled characters and one for AI controlled characters. We'll be looking specifically at the AI one since the player controlled one, although not perfect, is suitable enough and it's also best to consider that when it comes to multiplayer. This is a pretty decent balance. It introduces just the right amount of chaos in the multiplayer that makes it fun rather than cheap and utter horseshit throughout the race. But when it comes to the AI system, just come on. What the fuck is this? Mushrooms in all positions, triple mushrooms in every position except first and second. Why the hell are fifth to ninth getting blue shells? Like I can maybe understand the argument to get a blue shell in fourth, maybe fifth, but anything lower than that and it's more so just a wasted item slot that only helps those in front of you rather than yourself. Also there are definitely times when the probability doesn't play into the item system because I swear there are very convenient times where a bunch of powerful and targeting items just happen to come around to me at the same time. Especially the blue shells and oddly enough the bullet bill. The AI seems to always make it close to the front with the bullet bill even if they were down a whole 8 or 9 positions from where I am. I still don't understand the reason for the mega mushroom. It works quite literally like a star except it's vulnerable to lightning and bullet bills and is given to those in higher positions. Why not just put stars there instead- no, what the fuck am I saying? Just move it down to where the star probability is too. Speaking of which, I should probably talk about some of the new items introduced in this game. Those being the Mega Mushroom, an item that works kind of like a star but makes you vulnerable to two other items and makes you really big which means you can squash and fly on opponents in your way. Never saw much of a use for it since it almost acts like a star, and apparently so did Nintendo considering it has reappeared in one game only afterwards, and a mobile game at that. There also exists the Thundercloud, and I think this one isn't as bad as people make it out to be. Really, it's only the way the AI reacts whenever they attain it that gives it a bad rep. I think this item was pretty decently executed, only thing I change about it is by giving it slightly more time for those way back in the pack, but the item system wasn't designed with distance in mind, so shucks. Finally, we have the POW block, and I'm kind of mixed on this one. For one, you can easily trick out of it, which lets you maintain your speed but forces you to lose your item. A good trade off I imagine so. Maybe it would have been better if it wasn't locked to having to trick and was just the default occurrence, but the window isn't that small or anything, so it's not like a thing that pros can only pull off. And the fact that you can completely dodge it while airborne, something that happens a lot in this game due to the abundance of trick openings there is on many courses, doesn't make the item seem all that much of an annoyance in and of itself. But what doesn't help is, yet again, the item system. It seems like there has to be, at minimum, three of these every match. POW blocks are used so goddamn much by the AI, especially in 150cc and mirror. It can make traversing tracks, especially flatter ones, more difficult and also due to its frequent occurrence also forces you to frequently drop your items, which leaves you especially vulnerable against anything coming at you. And take into account that this is 150cc and mirror we're talking about. So more likely than not, you're going to get assered by literally items coming from thin air the moment you drop that banana in your inventory. I do think the POW block is often blown way too out of proportion, but it doesn't make me upset that they would remove it because frankly it never had that much of an impact on the gameplay of Mario Kart itself besides just making the AI more difficult to deal with in the higher engine classes. Speak of the devil, let's talk about how fucked the AI is and also sort of rubber banding, because mixed with the busted item system, it's pretty fucked. Mario Kart Wii increases the number of racers in a single match, from 8 to 12 total. This was very great for the purpose of online but for the Grand Prix it is a fucking nightmare to deal with because you can tell they simply just put them in there with no pursuit to balance them correctly. It was like they did the usual 8 racer programming first then realized they could add more races into a single match race and simply copy and paste the last 4 places again. Not only that, but it also imbalances the rubber banding system because now the top racers will have more speed in order to beat against a 12 racer herd, which makes them harder to pass by when they get ahead. And if you fall back against the entire herd, it can be a serious while before you can even imagine getting back to a top 4 position. Not only that, but the AI STILL only targets the player's character, which means you now have 12 of these pricks trying to bury you into the dirt. What may have been the equivalent of getting slammed into a wall in the earlier games is now like getting slammed into a wall, pulled to the curb, and getting a nice bite of the curb before then being tossed in front of a car during night hours on the highway. Tie that with the fact that the star ranking actually has a role in unlocking stuff, and you get yourself a one 
no, not even a one-way, a fucking ticket dispensary machine of retries because of how the star ranking system is. It's not as bad as Super Circuit, let me put that out there, but it's not in any way improved for a game like this. You bump into a wall too many times, you lose one. You drop down below 4 for more than 5 seconds, you lose one. You don't clear Grumble Volcano in less than 90 seconds, you lose one. God, come on! This would not be such an issue if they had no role in earning unlockables. I mean, yeah, I'm gonna complain about it, there's no doubt about that, I did it for Super Circuit, I'm gonna do it here too, but it wouldn't have any real effect on my view of the game because it wouldn't have served no purpose other than bragging rights had they not tied any unlockables to it. But now that it does, I have to not only try to earn at least one star just to get things, but do that while playing this! Now, Chaos in Mario Kart is nothing new, but the presence of Chaos in this game is astronomically something else. Chaos can be fun, but the way the Grand Prix pulls it off makes it often way too common and much more anarchist to the point of being a nuisance, especially if you're not playing to have fun, playing to try and win or unlock new stuff. Remember, this game still used the position priority when determining items rather than distance, which means at the very start of the race when everyone is crowded, someone in 10th can get a bullet bill and immediately speed up to first, knocking like 7 other racers back. It's simply just not balanced properly, and as a result, winning can seem like it's ultimately up to complete luck on the item system's part. And even using the best character and bite combo still won't be sufficient enough, it just makes the races less stressful to go through, only when you're at the top position. However, I still say they are the best options out there to try and outpace the AI in the higher engine classes because seriously, how the fuck are you supposed to deal with all of this using a fucking cart? At least use the basic bikes, it's the same as a cart but you get the wheelie with it. Just, just don't use a cart unless you really hate yourself. And there are better ways to deal with hating yourself, like running in front of a- <coughs> You know, in spite of all these very obvious issues and unbalanced mechanics, there are still people out there that consider this game one of the best in the series. BEST?! I mean, I wouldn't call it the worst, but I wouldn't let this even top Super Circuit in terms of best ranked. I just had to figure out why people like this game so much. And after doing a bit of digging, I came to the conclusion that Mario Kart Wii suffers what I like to call Melee Syndrome, where because of the game's unfiltered mechanics and dedicated fan base, he has gained a following out of it. And although I can agree to this sentiment in some ways, there are some parts of it I'd attest on to why it's not exactly all Melee-like. Okay, so in terms of the unexpected and crazy ultra shortcuts, the weird glitches, the characters themselves, sort of the bikes, the ability to choose the character skin in multiplayer, and its community and world records, yeah I'd say it's somewhat like Melee, but in terms of the actual meta itself, it feels more brawl-like to say. Now maybe not so much in terms of the actual gameplay or physics, since the physics are pretty fine if not a bit janky, unlike Brawl's slow and floaty physics engine. For real though, the fucking walls suck in this game. Come on, what is this? It feels more so the meta itself is kind of the way Brawl was oriented. Only the sports bike really matter in comparison to all the other bikes, and even then, not all sport bikes are put to the same level as only a few, the notable ones being Flame Runner and Mock Bike, which already means any lightweight character isn't really used in the meta, only heavy and medium weights, and although all the characters in those white categories can use those bikes with not much notable difference, when it comes to online or world records, it's very much a bias to only a few characters. Funky Kong, Daisy, Rosalina, and maybe Luigi and Yoshi. Really though, this is only to focus on the vehicles. Only two of the 36 vehicles are definitively viable, while the others in a similar category can get results, but not on the sheer level of representation that those two do. Another thing in a similar vein is the modding community. Now, the Melee community has just been recently modding their game to add more characters, stages, modes, and such, which means there may no longer be a universal agreement on this particular argument, but given that the Mario Kart Wii community has undergone modding around the time Brawl was too, along with the fact that mods were often done to either re-establish online support or fine-tune the game to add more to it and add additional modes and balances show a deeper connection between the two in terms of how they were treated by the modding scene. Only difference is CDGP didn't get fucked by tweets. <laughs> but seriously, the modding scene is absolutely fucking bonkers. They mod this game to the core, and it wouldn't surprise me if they were to work on reverse engineering the game so that they could... Oh. My. God.
Mario Kart Wii is the future. Another thing is the movement options. Many people think that the wheelie or inward drifting is like the melee wave dashing of Mario Kart series, but personally, I don't see it like that. Snaking seems to hold that title for me. In Melee, all characters can wave dash, but some just simply have it better or at least are more centralized in their meta, just like in Mario Kart DS where all vehicles can or have the ability to snake, just some can perform it better than others. Wheelies are not universal on all vehicles, only half of them total in Mario Kart Wii. To finally end this topic for all, there was a time I went over to a friend's house to play Mario Kart Wii online through Weemfee. Out of all the matches we played, we noticed two specific things. One. Everyone really liked sucking DK Mountain's dick, and two, everyone was either using Mac Bike or Flame Runner. But weirdly enough, there was a diverse amount of characters used. Not really any overload of funkies or daisies in the server. At most, maybe like three funkies and two daisies in one match. No, there really were some different characters in the mix, but there were only ones of the middle and heavyweight category because literally every fucking vehicle we passed that wasn't the singular person using super blooper god bless your fucking soul i don't know how you do it was either using mock bike or flame runner it doesn't ruin the game by any chance but it does show where the meta stands to the safe for pro and online players this meta however does allow for one thing to come out of it one thing so strong it is the fundamental holding block that keeps mario kart wii and that is representation from its community specifically the modding scene which we've discussed before but also the speed running and content content creator seen within the community. Mario Kart Wii has things known as checkpoints. Almost every Mario Kart game has them to some extent, but what makes the Wii's version so special is just the way the system works. It's very convoluting, so I'll just drop this video made by Jaden in the source description going into detail on how the checkpoint system exactly works, but to summarize, hitting specific loaded checkpoints and skipping beyond what the game can read will keep you counted in that region even though you're clearly not, and upon re-entering the same region will grant you a lap count. This leads to a variety of track glitches out of Found moments and world records best and worst nightmare ultra shortcuts. It's a good challenge for speedrunners and also gives content creators, tasks or not, a lot of watchful views to people in shock and awe at the magnificence of mankind's creation when they see Mr. Mario somehow win the race in less than 10 seconds because he drove around the rock. Most of the Mario Kart Wii content creators are definitely some of the most chill people on the planet and mix their content in a way so as to not turn the content stale, which they do surprisingly good considering they all mostly focus around one single game. Also, just seeing speedrunners waste hours of their life trying to take half a millisecond off from some other dude in the same situation is quite the dedication even if I don't understand how someone can do this for straight hours. I mean that Smash 64 video wasn't done in a day I can say that. Some of these guys run from the crack ass of dawn into the crack ass of dusk trying to pull off near frame perfect world records on Toad's fucking factory. Like bro if you're pulling this off on construction maybe you should let the labor force know who you are. The time, dedication, and representation put into this single game all by one community in order to keep it in the public's interest in discovering new ways to play or break the game in order to help creators earn their monthly check and speedrunners the reason to keep playing is yet another reminder that just like Melee, a community can be the standing pillar to a game that seems to hold no relevance in the modern era by making it relevant in any way possible. And that's just inspiring to me. I mean, it's not going to change my opinion on this game. I still think it's not on the same level as The Chosen 4. Like, those games are actually enjoyable. Listen, I'm sorry. It's not a bad game. It's not even a bad Mario Kart game. It's just... Subjectively, there are better options that suit my taste more. Even though I did have some of my moments here and there, they're you, they were usually only in the multiplayer and maybe a few times in the battle mode. Everything else is usually lackluster, frustrating, unnecessarily brutal, and even limiting in some options. There are some gameplay choices I do like about this game, such as how the vehicles handle and drift, the wheelie and trick mechanic, the vast amount of characters you can select, the many control options, and the great selection for the Nitro and Retro Cup. I do like all of those things, but just like with Melee, unless you're into the competitive or speedrunning aspect of the game, I don't see how this game can be anyone's favorite on an overall scale.
Oof, the bias sure did bite my ass during that segment, but Mario Kart Wii just isn't the one for me. I'm gonna have to say no deal on this one, dog. Now, like I said earlier, Mario Kart Wii is not the worst one for me, but it definitely does not rank in the top four. Double Dash and DS are pretty self-explanatory. These ones always had a community behind them that ultimately see them as superior products in spite of their early age compared to Wii. And Super Circuit comes from the pure subjective taste of me believing that it has the best form of handling difficulty with the AI, a balance between all the items, a damn good variety of tracks and a replay value for a handheld title. Even if the unlockables are a bit of a shortcoming compared to Wii, for something on a launch title handheld, they did pretty good. Even my biggest gripe with the game, the star rankings, although much more fucking bullshit to earn than in Wii, don't have anything tied to them besides bragging rights in the title screen. Whereas with Wii, you have to get at least one star on like everything to unlock some characters and carts. Really, it just doesn't have the controls like the first three do, so that's good on it, and the tracks are generally much more wide and open, allowing for more opportunity for tricks, drifts, and overall freedom on what you want to do without risking bumping into like everything for making a drift wrong or falling off the stage because your cart's turning is fucking poo poo garbage. In fact, some stages like N64 Bowser's Castle and SNES Ghost Valley 2 are so fucking huge compared to their first renditions, you'd have to be intentionally driving towards a wall to get stuck in one, or get bumped by the stupid AI that can always happen. Well, if there's one more thing I should talk about, it's the sound and animations. Like, I mean the ones during boosts and tricks, not really the niche stuff like the hits that we talked about or hopping and all that crap. The voice clips in this game are so expressive and good on your ears, along with a very good audio quality. Every voice and sound effect has such power to it, especially during tricks on the Wiimote every time you hear that sound effect and you can see your characters just popping the fuck off. Oh, it's so satisfying. The items also have that same fear and anxiety they always gave, especially with the return of the warning bubble from Double Dash, lets you know that it's your fifth time dealing with bullshit blue shells this track. Although one thing I think didn't age that well were the graphics. Well, less on the actual models and more on the color. It either looks way too desaturated or kind of samey. I mean, even Double Dash had more vibrant colors that stood out well against each other without looking off. Also, the characters and obstacles kind of have this glow to them. Them. I'm assuming that's the bloom effect since many AAA Wii games have that lighting tied to it, you know, to look advanced and all that, but it's just way too much in this game. It definitely doesn't harm my perspective on this game, I'm just pointing it out that it just looks kind of blurry here. Maybe if they turned off the lighting or at least toned it down, I feel like it would be less of an eyesore, especially when playing at night. You know, I have quite the love-hate relationship for this game. I wouldn't call it love-hate, I'd call it more like big little bro kind of a relationship. You know, you have your moments of fun here and there, but th those are just ultimately moments. And there's a reason why they're just moments. The game is just not fun on its own. It's only fun whether you're playing with friends or you're in a community which itself makes the game fun. If you're looking for a ball busting and challenging game, then Mario Kart Wii is there. If you're looking to have fun with a broken game and like the way the driving is in this game, then Mario Kart Wii is there. If you want to have a chaotic mess with friends, then Mario Kart Wii is there. I mean, I'd certainly take a chaotic mess with friends if that means I don't have to pick up Mario Kart 64's multiplayer. You know, despite my kerfuffle with the game, this was actually one of the best sellers of the Wii. I mean, besides Wii Sports, obviously. And despite the critical reviews it got, it still has a semi-positive reception towards it. And regarding um, the top four, I just want to let everyone know that by, by the end of the day, it's a subjective list. It's completely subjective. It's just the ones I see that rarely had any problems with it or improved the series overall. This game, it has, it has its things. You know, it has its moments, and it introduced a lot. But a lot, some of it, many of it, I would say, are just eh at best, and. Mario Kart Wii is not a bad game. The issues I have with it, however, are what makes it flawed to me. Subjectively, it's just not my cup of tea. It's not my cup of tea, and for that reason, I don't add it into the top four. And like I said, it's a subjective list. Don't let it not being in the top four affect you in any way. This is a fucking video, for God's sakes. Why would you let a YouTuber's opinion affect the way you think about a game? I mean, it's great to take insight and stuff like that, but don't, like, think, oh my God, what he said word for word. It's exactly it. It's exactly it. Like, unless it's describing something, you know, like, the way he described the, the fucking 
wheelie mechanic, you know, it was like, that's how I felt about it when I was playing. You know, that's fine, but just taking basic, you know, just taking, like, my opinion and being like, oh yeah, we gotta roll with that now, and like, nah, nah, nah. It's not bad. It's just flawed to me. You know, the top four is often a list of Mario Kart games that I consider ones that rarely gave me any problems or ones that I consider to have improved the series in a way that I would consider to have been very beneficial to its development. In fact, the next game, Mario Kart 7, is a game that I don't often really call bad by any means. It's not bad, and in fact it adds a lot to it, but, well, that's for the next video to talk about. Yeah, it's been, it hasn't been a while, but it's been a while since I've actually ran through this game before, but whatever, that'll be for next video. Until next time, this has been Luigi Lido complaining about another dumb video game, and yeah, that's, that's it, that's all I really gotta say. Peace out.